Naples Ark seeks the Eternal Circle, Zarathustra. Then there's only one place it can be going. Planet Mictum. The only ones who can release the locks are Little Master and Master Guinan. Pieta has acknowledged that the intruder is Master Guinan. <laughs> You're still haunted by that woman's shadow. I pity you. And ascend to a higher plane, to the realm of God. That power is not yours. You're simply being seduced by that power, just like I once was. Once we start the link, Go inside Rubido before you lose your body. Sorry, but I don't like to follow orders. Go back to Rubido. Chapter 57, Mictum. Now that Wilhelm's plan is almost complete, he and Kevin, along with Wilhelm's craft, Joshua, which even though it looks like an ES, it's not an ES, all leave the Damron and go to Mictum where Zarathustra is. Have we ever seen him outside the Damron? It seems that his Joshua was the Damron's power source because as soon as he leaves, the whole ship loses power. The whole Damron staff goes crazy as they have no idea what happened. We then see the Elsa with the whole group inside and leave Abel's Ark. They're forced to land on Mictum, which is now very close as Abel's Ark was still heading to Mictum this entire time. Because going to Mictum was safer than staying where they are, as they're being attacked by multiple Ormus ships. So, it seems Margulis didn't follow Heinlein's wishes. Speaking of, we see Margulis talking to Heinlein, who is now pretty pissed off that Margulis hasn't called his fleet back. Margulis tells him that they can't allow the Gnosis to destroy Mictum. I, I, think, I think they succeeded at that. You're about 21 years too late. He also says that, Zar that Zarathustra is on Mictum, and without it, they can't return to Lost Jerusalem, because he still believes this is their goal. At this point, Heinlein is just annoyed by Margulis. Ugh. Then, in Wilhelm's voice, he says, It seems you've had a great misunderstanding. What? Wilhelm reveals himself before Margulis. Wilhelm's about to Wilhelm's about to wreck this man's life. Wilhelm tells Margulis that he has served him well, but his faith was too strong and it has blinded him. Then he tells him the true purpose and origin of Ormus, not the bullshit story that they've been spouting this whole time. This is all stuff we already know, about how it began after Jesus' crucifixion and how its real purpose was to manage the words he left behind, Lanagetan, um, along with the ancient relics like Zarathustra. When Margulis asks him if the goal to return to lost Jerusalem was a lie, Wilhelm plainly tells him, Yes, exactly. You needed words, faith, to define who you are. What were you planning on doing once you returned to that place? Margulis, Margulis then asks him if everything they've done has been meaningless, but Wilhelm tells him that it wasn't, as long as he believes it wasn't. Then Voyager and Kevin appear behind Margulis, and Wilhelm asks Margulis what he will do now. Leave or continue down this path even knowing that it's all been a lie. Before we hear the answer, we cut to the Elsa now landed on Mictum. Not just Mictum, but they're an Archon the city where Voyager made his debut, the city Jan Sauer, Ziggy, was stationed in on Pied Piper. They all decide to go into the center of the city to investigate a large gathering of Gnosis, but before doing so, Rubido tells Matthews that if anything happens, they should live without them and just follow Julie Miserai's instructions. Knowing that this will be a big event, Rubido recruits everyone he can. He tells Alan to come as Xion will need support since she isn't looking too good, and Kanan to support Jin and his ES. Then they all head outside into their ESs. Once outside, Rubido notices how ever since they got to Mictum, both Kanan and Ziggy have been acting weird. But they brush it aside and continue to move forward. 
further in, they encountered Richard and Herman. Huh. Didn't think they'd just randomly appear again, did you? Some banter ensues between Richard, Herman, and Rubido, but nothing worth noting. They engage in battle with them and Dave, and they're defeated. The only thing worth noting here is that after the battle, their now awakened vessels of Anima and said their ESs are retrieved by Voyager and his, and his ES, and then he flies off. After this, they continue further into the city when Ziggy takes note of a symbol on a building. It's a symbol of the Galaxy Federation Police Department, where he used to work. Now he's sure of what he's been wondering since he got to, since he got to Mictum. This is where he faced off against Voyager. He probably wasn't sure because back then the planet was called the Braxis. Nearby, they found a group of humans turned to salt, which is especially sad considering the escape shuttle platform was right next to them. Speaking of the escape pod platform, Xion's pendant suddenly begins to glow and she feels a sudden sense of sadness and fear coming towards a specific escape pod. I wonder why. From behind them, Pellegrin flies towards them in her ES and attacks them. Jin tries to tell her that they have no reason to fight her, and she explains the significance of this, of this planet to Jin, saying that this is the birthplace of Ormus. Shows how little they know about their own organization. She tells them that this she tells them that this planet's destruction was caused by the Federation, which she's not wrong, and they vow revenge against them. Unfortunately, it seems Pellegrin was told of Wilhelm's deception by Margulis, so now she's here without a purpose. She's here because she doesn't know anything else, and so she engages in combat with Jin, not really caring whether or not she lives. Jin begrudgingly fights and defeats her, and as her ES blows up, he tells her to bail out of her ES to save herself. But Pellegrin is just done. She's tired and she has lost her reason to live. Without her faith, Pellegrin sees no reason to continue living, and so... She just sits in her yes as it blows up with her inside of it. As it falls to the ground, the awakened vessel of Anima inside of it is, again, retrieved by Voyager. Ziggy, who is looking pissed, recalls his fight with Voyager and tells the group that he may know where the Zohar is. It's in a Zohar research facility. Rubido asks him why he's been keeping these memories a secret, but Ziggy tells him that he wasn't keeping it a secret, but his memory is fragmented, and it seems that he has subconsciously repressed this specific memory. When Rubido asks him why, Ziggy says, Even cyborgs get nightmares. I tried everything I could to erase it. A nightmare? That place is the stage of my nightmare. It is an abominable place. Once they arrive at, at the facility, Jin mentions how it looks more like some kind of church. Ziggy tells him that the church was more of a front and that the research of the Zohar took place underground, both metaphorically and literally. Inside the cathedral, Voyager awaits them. I've been waiting for you, Jan Sauer. Ziggy knew he would be here, not only because of the underground Zohar research facility, but because he knew Voyager would want to recreate the day of his nightmares. Ziggy explains to Rubido that this is where Voyager killed his family before telling Voyager that he's already dead and whatever he thinks he's doing is not going to work. But Voyager knows that, his, that, his mem that this memory still haunts him, that time stopped for him on the day his family died. He tells him that, he became a that if he became a testament with him, like he offered, he wouldn't have had to suffer. The idea of Ziggy as a testament surprises Momo, and Voyager tells her that they shouldn't be surprised as all of them have the ability to become testaments, meaning that all of them have shining wills and that he, meaning Wilhelm, knows this thanks to an observation program he placed in a special realium. This is when he reveals to everyone Kanan's true nature. Program Kanan, or perhaps I should say, Lactus. Ziggy is surprised to hear the name Lactus, as he had no idea that Kanan was the same reality he fought alongside of 100 years ago during Pied Piper. Kanan admits to Ziggy that he was assigned to observe both Jan Sauer and Voyager, Eric Weber, 100 years ago. Kanan's voice is filled with pain as he tells a disappointed Rubido that he has indeed been betraying them. Understand that the observation isn't just about looking for people with shining wheels, it's also, well, an observation. So Wilhelm knows everything about our group that Kanan knows. Even if Kanan doesn't want this to be the case, he has no choice, especially since he didn't even know about the Kanan project up until recently when doctors gave him that data to scam. 
Voyager, mockingly, tells Rubido not to be so hard on Kanan, as this is simply how he was made, just like Rubido was made to be a weapon. Then Ziggy demands that Voyager tells him what his objective is, his personal objective. Why did he become a testament? He says that he did it to escape the fear of death and to have eternal pleasure. The only reason he concerns himself with Ziggy is because he wanted to spend his eternal life with him. Which sounds oddly romantic for Voyager. Whether this was some kind of romantic attachment to Ziggy or obsession with him, one thing is for sure. Voyager does not take rejection well and that's exactly what Ziggy did when he chose to kill himself a hundred years ago. He rejected him. Then he prepares E.S. Dan for combat, and Ziggy jumps into action after Voyager taunts him. Except this time, I will have the pleasure of finishing you off myself, just like I did your own son. Eric! The group managed to disable E.S. Dan, and immediately after, its awakened vessel of anima is recovered. This time by E.S. Judah, Kevin's E.S. Voyager himself, however, is of course completely okay. Oh no. Ziggy, letting his anger get the best of him, jumps out at him and, come on man, at least try a different maneuver or weapon. This is the third time you try to get him with the exact same move. <sighs> of course, it doesn't work and Voyager pins Ziggy down on the ground by the face. You should know by now it's impossible for you to harm me. You would think so, huh? Kanan then steps in to stop Voyager from killing Ziggy. Kanan tells Voyager that he wants to make a deal with him. Although Voyager thinks he has conquered death thanks to the power Wilhelm gave him as a testament, Kanan tells him that, that if Wilhelm dies, Voyager's power would fade. Using this logic, he eventually manages to convince him that his eternal life hinges on his trust in Wilhelm, and trust is something that Voyager has said himself is meaningless. Kanan then tells Voyager that his program Kanan in order to communicate directly with Wilhelm, is actually connected to Wilhelm's power, the compass of chaos and order. This means that if he links with Kanan, he can directly link and absorb the power of the compass, the power of Wilhelm. All Kanan wants in return is to be made into a testament. This deal catches Rubido and Ziggy by surprise, not expecting a conscious betrayal from Kanan. Kanan tells him that he doesn't want to live on with the label of traitor, which is, why, which is why he wants to become a testament, which makes no sense because he would still be alive just as a testament, which is technically dead, but you know. Well, fear not, Kanan isn't stupid. As Voyager links with Kanan, he sees what it is he desired, Wilhelm's power. But as he reaches out to it, this, I will become God. What? My power. My power is fading. Eric could not handle the power of Wilhelm, and instead of, absor uh, of absorbing it, the power is reducing him down to nothing. This is why Kanan's reasoning was stupid, because it was bullshit. Kanan knew this would happen. Kanan knew that it wouldn't work. Unfortunately, in order to ensure that Voyager dies for good, Kanan maintains the link until he is gone, and that link is causing him to fade away as well. Ziggy tries to tell him to let go, as there is as there will be no coming back from this. His very existence is fading, but Kanan is content with his decision, as he prefers dying for his friends than existing for the purpose of betraying his friends. Like this! Kanan! Farewell, Ruby Doll. I pray for the success of your mission. After his death, Ziggy laments the fact that he failed to save him, but Rubido tells him that he is free from his curse. Ziggy then realizes that Kanan, Lactus, made the same choice that he once did a hundred years ago. He chose to die of his own free will instead of live for someone else's. The group then continue forward until they come across an experimentation ward on the Zo for the Zohar. There they encounter Margulis inside E.S. Levi. Margulis, knowing that Pelagi was waiting outside, knows that their arrival here means Pelagri is dead. Margulis and Jin complement each other's tenacity, and Margulis begins to ponder upon the idea that his actions may have had a hand in destroying Mictum, his home planet, as his overzealousness clouded his eyes to the truth that should have been obvious. Although Jin chastises him for his 
followers who died for his beliefs, Margulis believes that those that died with their faith are the lucky ones. In contrast, having lost his faith, he feels like a pathetic pet abandoned by his master. Lacking the strength of the wild, he merely exposes his pitiful form to the world and waits to die. Margulis, much like Pellegrief, now feels lost since he knows that everything he has lived for has been a lie. Now, even the title of People of Zohar, something that the native of Braxens held in high regard, means nothing. The only thing Margulis has is the hope for a final confrontation with Jin, as he says, Even a fool has his pride. Knowing there is no use trying to talk him out of it, both men ready up for a fight, and the final battle with Margulis commences. Yeah, this whole section is one giant boss, boss fight montage. After some time, Jin, well, everyone, but the cutscene shows only Jin fighting him alone while everyone watches, so we'll just say Jin, strikes a fatal blow to Margulis, or, well, to his ES. Realizing his defeat, Margulis becomes calm, seemingly emotionally defeated as he tells Jin, Jin, you are exceptional. But your strength means that you will always be alone in this world. You've cast aside the few people who understood you by your own hands. Now, there is no one left who understands you. Having too much pride to either surrender to Jin or be defeated by him, Margulis chooses instead to end his own life. For Jin, this is an empty victory. Despite their rivalry and bad blood, Margulis was once a part of Jin's life. Then, much like with every other ES, the, vessels, the vessel of Anima from ES Levi is also retrieved by ES Judah. Then, Shion's pendant begins to glow, and she hears a voice calling her. So the group follows Shion as she heads towards the voice. Chapter 58 Mary Shion and the rest head deeper into the facility, into what looks like a mine. There, they find some kind of crystalline structure that sucks them into an area completely made out of the same crystal-like material. Deeper in this area, they come across what looks like a dead end. Then, Xion gets one of her headaches again, but she comes out fine. Ziggy then notices some, letter on th some letters on the ground, letters similar to the one on Vanilla Chateau. Momo deciphers some of it. Momo, can you read it? And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. That's the only text I can decipher. The rest isn't in my data. Then, as Jin observes the structure around them, Cosmos confirms that this whole crystalline structure is made out of the same material as Xion's necklace, and that the structure expands all throughout the planet. Why are they made of the same stuff? Well, what is Xion's pendant? It's the activation key to Zarathustra. So, what is this crystalline structure there inside of? Yeah, it's Zarathustra. The thing I showed you in the first video of the series is actually more akin to Zarathustra's control terminal. But Zarathustra itself is this whole crystal structure. After Junior wonders why Ormus would want to protect this little room, Cosmos tells them that this is not a dead end, as she detects a large energy source behind the wall at the back of this room. Xion gets another headache as she hears someone calling her, but this time she faints. Xion. Who is that? Why do you appear before me? Tell me, who are you? Xion. <gasps> Abel? This form is what you have defined me as. If you call this form Abel, then I am Abel. You're Udu, aren't you? I am just one of the ways that Udu is perceived. Udu wants to know. Know what? About the wills that desire a dissipating world. Everything about you. Everything about this world. I don't know any of that. Xion, are you feeling pain right now? Is pain a method to recognize yourself? Why do you all seek pain? 
I don't know. I don't know either. You don't know? I don't know as well. No matter how much you hurt yourselves, no matter how much you hurt others, it won't make you feel better. So why? Xion, why do you exist in this world? What does your heart try to see in the abyss of despair? Where is the real you? The real me? I'm right here. I don't understand. Where am I? I want to know. What am I? Who will define me? That's right. I'm alone. Only that song heals me. That's right. He is the only one who heals me. What I want is... Xi'an wakes up to Momo and Jin standing over her. As she gets up, Nephilim appears behind her. Nephilim tells her that what she's seeking is beyond this room and that in order to open the passage, Xi'an will have to open it herself. She then explains that this room was sealed by a woman who could, call the, who could call to the power of God in order to prevent what lies ahead from falling into the wrong hands. What lies ahead, being Zarathustra, however, will not be opened until the woman awakens. When Xi'an asks her who this woman is, she tells Xi'an that it's someone she knew well in the past life. She tells Xi'an that this woman, that if this woman awakens, Xi'an will have to make a painful choice and that the awakening will start to erode her life away and that nobody would shame her for turning back now, as everybody understands the pain that Xi'an has gone through. But Xi'an says that nobody knows her pain and that nobody has been there for her when she needed her help, except for Kevin. How do you feel? Do you feel relaxed? Yes, I'm sorry. I guess I've been worrying everyone. Don't worry about it. We're friends, right? When stuff happens, don't hesitate to tell us. Thanks. Despite having a whole last support group of friends and family, Xi'an has managed to convince herself that Kevin is here is her one and only savior. Even Nephilim tells her that everyone has been by her side, but Xi'an says, Then why didn't they save me? They stayed away from me, like I was some kind of a disease. Are you kidding me, Xi'an? Okay. Get ready, because Xi'an is about to become the most hated character in the game. Even as Nephilim pleads her not to lose sight of herself and not to let Kevin's words overcome her, Xi'an continues telling Nephilim how alone she is and how nobody tried to save her. She decides she wants to do whatever it is she has to do to awaken this woman, because she wants to take responsibility for calling the Gnosis, which are slowly causing the destruction of the universe. Alan, however, tries to stop her, asking her why she has to do everything by herself and telling her that they can find another way to put their heads together. Xi'an shoots back with, You're so naive! The situation is already far beyond that! Alan, what power do you have? Can you save me? Can you save my life? I... You don't have any power at all! If you can't do anything, then just shut up! Even Jen steps in to tell her that she's gone too far. After another headache, Xi'an tells Nephilim that she's ready to awaken the woman, and after a blinding light, Xi'an wakes up on René Le Chateau. But not just René Le Chateau, she's in a memory of René Le Chateau when it was alive, meaning she's on Lost Jerusalem, Earth. Xi'an goes into where they found the destroyed graves, but now they're still intact. In fact, they look brand new. When she approaches Mary's casket, she notices someone hiding behind a cross. It's Chaos. Knowing why Xi'an is here, Chaos points towards Mary's casket before disappearing. Xi'an opens the casket and inside she finds Mary's body. Xi'an notes how much like Cosmos and Telos she looks. As she comments on how beautiful she looks, Mary's eyes open. Yes, in case it wasn't obvious, the woman Nephilim was talking about was Mary. I kept saying woman to avoid confusion because Xi'an still doesn't know her by this name. Anyways, after Mary opens her eyes, Xi'an sees visions from Mary's past. One from a time when her and Yeshua, Chaos, were listening to Jesus preach. As Xi'an sees the next vision, she gets a feeling of anger or sadness and despair. I'm not sure what's going on here. It almost looks like Yeshua was angry at Mary for some reason and left her behind, but I couldn't really find much information on the scene, so that's why I never brought it up on the first video of the series. I hate inserting theories into these videos, but I personally think that maybe Mary splits Yeshua's power into 12 pieces against his will, so he got angry and left her behind, so he wasn't around when she eventually lost her maiden, Shem's predecessor, 
and then died. But this is just my own theory, and as far as I know, there isn't really anything that talks about Mary and Chaos' relationship in depth, which is a shame. Anyways, the next vision is of Mary crying over the body of her dead maiden. Then she sees Mary, who briefly switches into Cosmos crying in, in a field of flowers. According to Shion, she's crying because she has lost sight of herself and feels alone. Again, I don't know why, because there's nothing that goes much in depth on chaos in Mary's past, which is, again, a damn shame. Shion, being able to relate to these feelings, approaches Mary and hugs her, telling her that they can help each other find the answers they seek. As the screen fades to black, a voice calls out to Shion. This time, we hear it. Shion. That was Mary's voice, and with that, Shion regains consciousness. A blue-eyed Cosmos approaches her and helps her to her feet. Mary has now completely awakened inside Cosmos. She's here to stay. We can see in her mannerisms and even in her voice that she is much more human now. But before we have much of a moment, Tello shows up. Mary. Tello speaks to Mary, telling her that she's not supposed to dwell inside of Cosmos. She's supposed to dwell inside of her. This is getting weird. Telos rushes to Cosmos and they start fighting, but this time Cosmos is actually able to keep up. For once, everyone else decides to join in the fight, but they don't really stand a chance against Telos. Telos then explains that the deep lore of Mary, how Mary is the partner of Jesus, how Mary's body is Telos' body, and how Mary's consciousness is inside of Cosmos. So now Telos wants to rip Mary's consciousness out of Cosmos so she can fully awaken as the real Mary Magdalene, as only then will body and soul be reunited. She also tells Shion that she, Shion, is Maiden's Mary. Cosmos then starts fighting Telos again, alongside Rubido, who's, again, useless against her. Cosmos then blocks Shion from Telos' shot. As she blocks her, Shion asks her what, he, what she is. Cosmos tells her that she is both Mary and not Mary. It seems that by awakening inside of Cosmos, instead of Telos, she has become something new entirely, so we will call her Coast Mary. I'm not kidding, that's what I'm going to call her. By the way, this whole time, Telos has still been trying to shoot her from the same position. It's not until almost a minute of ineffective shooting that she decides to rush Cosmos, but Cosmos grabs her arm. Cosmos tells Telos, Listen, Telos. If your existence will bring harm to my friends in any way, then I will be forced to stop you. Tello laughs at the idea of Cosmos defeating her, defeating her and, another boss, and another boss fight against Tellos begins. After Tellos is defeated, even her cocky ass has to admit that Cosmos is much more powerful now, but she is determined to beat her. She begins to charge the PT Canada that she used on Cosmos last time she destroyed her. However, Cosmos stands firm and tries to block it, much like she did the first time. But this time, she succeeds. Not only does she block it, but she neutralizes it. Then she shows up a new trick up her sleeve. She opens up her chest piece, much like Tello's. Yes, I know how ridiculous this looks. Me and every other Xenosaga fan hate this design, but it's there, so we have to get over it. Okay? Okay. As Tello shoots another bigger PT cannon charge, Cosmos charges up her own and shoots back. The two beams collide, merge, and are redirected towards Tello's. The beam holds Telos in some kind of we in some kind of stasis field, and when Cosmos throws a knife at it, it just kind of implodes with Telos inside of it. Finally, Telos has been disposed of. She will not be missed. As Cosmos approaches Telos' body, they both begin to resonate. The body of Mary and the will of Mary then come together, and the path in front of them opens. Cosmos, are you all right, Cosmos? Xi'an. Thank you. There's no need to be concerned. I am fine. 